Hey, welcome to Genre Chat. I'm Caleb Walton, and tonight our guest is Aaron Gansky. How are you doing, Aaron? Hello. I'm doing well. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing good. I'm doing really good. How is it out there in California? You guys close to where all the wildfires and stuff were? We are. In, we're in the middle of the desert, so wildfires don't like they don't scare me. It's like a it's like a match in a sandbox. Like it's not. <laughs> It's not spreading, so. Yeah, that's kind of got a, a natural firewall built in. So exactly. Good. Firewall's a nice term, by the way. That's That was well played. I, I caught the pun that you did there. But, <laughs> well, uh, I'm really excited to have you on the show. I know you got a lot of cool stuff coming up with the, the new Hand of Adonai book coming out. Tell me a, a little bit more about that. What's, what's this one going to be about? So this will be the third book in the series. I'm actually going to be releasing two uh, with Brimstone Fiction. So I'm pretty excited about that. We've been cooking this up for a while now. And... Uh, we're going to release, I don't know if we're releasing them on this at the same time or not, uh, but we'll be releasing them very close together. And one of the things that I'm really excited about is uh, the first one is going to be a novella um, mm -hmm. and it's going to be free. So we're going to have a nice. free digital only uh, novella with, that takes place within the world of Al Ruja, kind of the Hand of Adonai series and, uh, and explores that and expands that. And then book three will come out and it's kind of the continuing adventures of uh, our characters, uh, Lauren Oliver and Erica and Aiden and all the others, Bailey Renee that gets in there. Um, and it's, it's one of those series that just kind of the, the scope just really increases. Uh, you get to see parts of the world that you haven't seen before, um, meet new characters. One of my favorite characters is in the novella coming up and it's 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 a lot of fun so uh, a lot of really cool things i don't want to give away too much but um i'll just i'm actually uh, don't give away too many spoilers i'm actually in the middle of the first book right now so okay. <laughs> don't give nice. away too many spoilers right, what's the right. third one called what's the name the of the third one? one the third one is called the seven seals nice uh, and uh the the novella will be called the shadow assassin so those are our working oh titles. Right awesome. That, I, you really got a knack for the titles. Like I love it. each one of those has been really good. I'm always racking my brain for a good working title for something. <laughs> it's tough. The blood sword, the blood sword is, is the, the second one in the series. That one feels a little bit on the nose, but um, usually try and name them after like important artifacts or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a fantasy genre trope, you know? So, um, but yeah, we kind of, I bounced some of those titles off my publisher and stuff like that. And that's what we came up with. So. That's pretty cool. Um, Do you always get to pick the title? I've always wondered that when you get a book published, you get to pick the title or does the publisher usually pick it for you? You know, it really depends on the publisher um, mm -hmm. that you're working with. I typically work with smaller indie publishers, um, you know, just kind of the small, small presses and, and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And so uh, because they're smaller, they're usually a lot more willing to take author input on covers and That's good. Uh, on titles and things like that. Uh, the bigger houses, not always. And mm -hmm. A lot of times that's just, here's your book, here's your title, here's your cover. Enjoy. <laughs> um, sometimes you can give them notes and they kind of say, that's adorable and cute. And, um, <laughs> they don't listen much to it. So, um, yeah, so if so, you're a control freak, you need to know ahead of time that you're going to have zero control. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I worked with Eddie on a bunch of our titles for LPC and stuff like that. He's got a good, good knack for titles mm -hmm. as well. That's awesome. Well, I wanted to talk about fantasy novels today and maybe get a little bit into the YA because I know Hannah Bad and I kind of goes goes both ways. It's a, it's a YA fantasy series. So I wanted to kind of hit on both of those. But first, I, for those of us that, that may not know, how did you first get started in writing? What made you choose fantasy and, and this genre in particular? So writing fantasy actually was not something that i had ever planned on doing. Um, I got my master's degree. And so everything that I was reading was you know, highbrow literary, mm -hmm. you know, all the greats and the masters and this and that. And uh, a lot of really edgy kind of contemporary type stuff, because uh, that's what the, the college I intended, uh, really like that kind of stuff. And so I, I kind of figured that's where I was going. Um, but I, I just completed my first novel, The Bargain, and mm -hmm. you know, agonized over every word, every turn of phrase, every simile, every metaphor, and just really, you know, struggled to make that as, as literary and, and Mm -hmm. know, thematic as possible like I just really wanted that to be the great American novel mm -hmm. which it is by the way you should buy it but um, <laughs> after that <laughs> I thought fantasy sounds like fun I've always loved especially the Final Fantasy series I love the Final Fantasy series and mm -hmm. I was playing a lot of Skyrim and I thought it would be fun to do just uh, just to do a fantasy I don't have to worry about trying to be highbrow literary and worry about every turn of phrase and um, turns out I still worried about every turn of phrase and every, you know, chapter and every word and every sentence. And, um, so I feel like I kind of brought some of that literary 
style to mm-hmm. the fantasy genre, but I, I still want to pay homage to the the fantasy genre and its its uh, well established established tropes mm-hmm. and things of that nature. So, uh, bottom line is, it was just fun. It was it was essentially fan service for me, um, and I, I enjoy writing it. So I I didn't think I would, but here I am loving it. That's awesome. What made you want to do a YA fantasy series instead of like something for an adult? And honestly, what's the difference? What what changes when you're when you're aiming it toward young people is is rather than aiming it toward adults with something like the Game of Thrones or something like that? What what changes in the style? Typically, it's the um, it's the age of the protagonists. Mm-hmm. So like a Game of Thrones, um, your primary characters are all adults, um, and so that series, if you haven't read it, it, is absolutely geared toward adults. Don't let your mm-hmm. children read it. Um, well. I mean, I, make your own parenting decisions. But I'm not gonna say <laughs> I wouldn't allow my children to read it. Um, whereas a, a YA fantasy, um, typically the the protagonists are going to be a little bit younger. For me, um, I was w- dealing with contemporary teenagers. And as a teacher, a high school teacher, I, I felt like that was a natural thing um, that I could do well. I felt like I could do that well. Mm-hmm. And if, I thought if I tried it and I sucked at it, I would have 150 people telling me immediately how bad I sucked at it. Um, <laughs> so, Honestly, guaranteed honest feedback. <laughs> absolutely. They're not going to try and pull any punches. So especially, you know, you gave me an F. This was terrible. No. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, it was something that I just felt like it was kind of a natural thing. Um, I wanted to write about kids. Uh, teenagers are, are interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they take things very, very seriously. Um, maybe not school, but other things they take very, very seriously. And it's a, it's really a time of growing up. So there's a lot of interpersonal conflict, uh, a lot of self-discovery that goes on as well as discovery of a new world and a, a kind of an, a, an overwhelming world at times. And so mm-hmm. uh, I felt like that was a natural way to increase the tension and the stakes and the conflict in the story. I like that. And I bet being around, because I know you, you do teach at a high school, I mean, being around teenagers and stuff like that helps you get inside their head. Because that's one of the things that really impressed me. I was real. I was like, oh, yeah, I, I can see that. I thought exactly like that when I was a teenager. Yeah. <laughs> so I use a lot of good research. It's right there. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I still think like a teenager. So that helps. <laughs> yeah, actually- that always helps. I feel like, so I was like, uh, yeah, I'm 12 years old inside. I'm like, really? Man, you're a lot more mature than I am inside if you think you're 12. Oh, actually, what are some yeah. of the main characteristics of fantasy that people are going to want to see when they read a book and that publishers are going to look for when they're, when they're reviewing it? Well, if you're doing fantasy by the numbers, there are, are several things, um, but uh, on, a, on a larger, broader scale, mm-hmm. so that my answer isn't two hours long here, <laughs> um, really what they're looking for is kind of an epic scope. Fantasy readers are very big into um, setting and world building. Mm -hmm. Um, They're they're very uh, in tune with that and they want to know what this new and strange world looks like. It's it's discovery for them. It's Mm -hmm. discovery for them. And they're also pretty militant about rules, the rules that you set up in your world and if things are gonna work or not work. Um, the, I think the prime example of that is, is the latest Harry Potter film that's been getting a lot of mm. negative press because mm-hmm. people are like, oh, well, it's not consistent with the world that she's established. And it's, mm-hmm. you know, so, you know, she's doing fantastic. If this is the first time she's getting criticism for one of her <laughs> films and one of her books, then, you know, more power to her. She's a, I, I really like Rowling. I think she's a phenomenal yeah. Mm-hmm. author, but uh, Epic Scope is what they're looking for. A big world. Um, they're looking for uh, usually some sort of swords and sorcery. They want, you know, swords and armor and magic and um, they're like elves and dwarves and and things of that nature. But really, uh, I think it's for them, they want something that feels unique and original. Um, even if it's familiar, they want something that's going to be uh, different enough that it's still worth uh, kind of walking down that street and exploring that particular world, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. It does. And now all we need is a, a, a Magic the Gathering deck for Hand of Adonai. That would be, that could be a really good release for the next. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've been cooking up some ideas. I, I, I've been cooking up some ideas to try and join my two loves, Magic the Gathering <laughs> and writing. So That's we'll honestly, see. while I'm reading it, that's what I'm picturing in my mind is some of the same creatures in the same settings and stuff with the forest yeah. and, the, and the huge cities. I'm like, I bet that had something to do with this idea. <laughs> you know? 
I may or may not be posting uh, Magic the Gathering cards based in Al Ruja on my Facebook. So that would be that awesome. may or may not. I would, I would definitely buy those. Yeah. I would definitely buy those. How does the structure of a novel change when, when you're moving to the fantasy genre? I know I was doing some research a while back on word count and on the different links, and it's like, you know, we're something like a, a romantic suspense would be maybe 70 to 80,000 words. People are, expect a fantasy novel to be a lot longer than that for all the extra world building that it requires. Is, is, I mean, is that right? Is that something that you've, you've, you've seen? Yeah, and, and what I've also noticed is that that comes from their readership. Fantasy readers are, are notoriously patient, mm -hmm. um, shockingly so, I would say. Um, <laughs> if you look at the Wheel of the Time series, it's 14 books all of them are about a thousand pages or more <sighs> this one is 998 pages and i was that's exhausting i mean just from a writer's perspective that seems like it would be exhausting <laughs> yeah i don't have time to read that i don't know where he found time to write it um so it's it, that that kind of thing is um more the uh i guess the the expectation rather mm -hmm. than the exception uh, not all books are that long, especially when you go to like kind of the younger, uh, like YA middle grade, like the Narnia series is, mm -hmm. I mean, you could put the, all of the books into one of the wheel of time. And mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it does vary by um, target audience, uh, the grade, the grade level of the audience or the age of the audience. It also varies by the publisher. Uh, one of the reasons we're doing uh, a novella and a book three is simply because book three itself was too large. It was mm -hmm. more than my publisher was willing to to print for a single um, book. And that's because the price point goes up. Uh, the longer the book, the more it costs them to produce, the more they have to sell it for. And so um, now instead of buying my book for 15 bucks, you have to buy it for 20. Um, mm -hmm. And that gets a little bit, you know, like, are we yeah. really going to be able to sell the book at $20 and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. we thought this was the way to go. Uh, but yeah, by and large, in terms of word count, fantasy, you have a lot more room to play with. Um, you don't have to worry about going a little bit longer uh, mm -hmm. because the readers are typically going to be patient. So, What's generally the acceptable length? I mean, I know it kind of probably fluctuates between publishers and, and, and who, you, who you go with. What's, what's a generally acceptable length, do you think? So I would default to the normal industry standards. Um, mm -hmm. if, if you're a new writer, I would default to the normal industry standards. If you look at the Sorcerer's Stone, is that what it's uh, the first Harry Potter? Mm -hmm. um, it depends on which country you're in. But <laughs> yeah, Sorcerer or Philosopher. Um, it's much smaller than, uh, you know, Deathly Hallows. Deathly Hallows is twice the size, um, mm -hmm. roughly. And that's because as the first book started to sell and the second book started to sell and there's this momentum and people you are know people it. are going to buy the last book you don't have to question is it going to sell <laughs> yeah but each book increased in length and that's because mm -hmm. rowling had developed a reputation and people would drop 30 45 bucks on her or, or 45 dollars on her books or whatever mm -hmm. the case may be for the hardcovers and all that so um that was far less of a risk for the publisher and mm -hmm. that kind of gave her um creative license to do what she saw fit um, as a, I'm not JK Rowling. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry if you invited me on the podcast thinking I was, but I'm not. <laughs> um, I understand why you might be confused, but, uh, uh, since I'm, I don't quite have the reputation of a Stephen King or, or a JK Rowling who can basically write whatever they want and get it published. Um, you know, smaller time authors like me, we've got to play more by the, the industry standards. And so for, for us, that means um, about 75,000 to 95,000 words. 95,000 would probably be the long one, mm -hmm. definitely no more than 100. Um, so if you're writing a fantasy and you're a first time uh, novelist, you haven't published anything else, you probably want to kind of aim closer to that 75, I would imagine. But usually anywhere between 75 and 100, it's going to cost the same to publish a, a book of that size. So. Uh, that's it kind of sucks as a new author when you look and you're like, okay, well, they can do that. I mean, when you're George R. R. Martin, you can have five years in between two books and your publisher will patiently wait for you, but not everybody gets that leniency. Exactly. Oh, my goodness. He needs to finish the books, man. Stop <laughs> worrying about the show and give me more books. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. And I, I wanted to go back to the world building a little bit. I know you were talking about that. What are some things that you do to help with that process? I mean, I've heard some uh, writers say they have like a rule book for themselves of, you know, this is something you've established, so you've got to stick with it. I mean, what, what are some of the processes that you go through when you're, when you're trying to establish that world? I think I'm different than the normal fantasy author. I at least began different than the normal fantasy author because 
one of the things that I wanted to do, I was intentionally writing to um, kind of challenge and perhaps even um, break a lot of the expectations and, and mm -hmm. quote unquote rules and the expected tropes of fantasy. I was gonna write a standalone novel. I determined mm -hmm. that I was gonna be a standalone novel. I wasn't gonna write about politics and I wasn't gonna be falling into you know 18 chapters of world building and I wasn't mm -hmm. gonna do any of that. And so when I started the novel, I, I wanted just kind of a quick, fast paced um, um, story which is what I feel like I ended up with, but I, I found as I was writing, um, the genre really demands those things for a reason. Mm -hmm. And so I, I had to start putting in some political intrigue and I had to start putting in some um, some more of the world. And what I did is I, I tried to do it a little more organically. A lot of people will sit down and, and world build first and they'll come up with their magic system and their rules and they'll come up with they'll name all the enemies and the good guys and the bad guys and they'll do all that i just started writing mm -hmm. and as i wrote something that i knew was going to be significant that i would probably end up using again i kind of put that into my story bible so as i was writing the main story i was also creating my story bible at the same time Mm -hmm. Are you an organic writer by nature or do you like to outline more sort of a mixture of the two what, what, what's your stance on that for me, I'm very much a discovery writer. Um, mm -hmm. It's what I enjoy because if I know where my story is going, I feel like my readers know where their story is going. Mm -hmm. And that's, I, I don't like to write things that are too wildly predictable. I mm -hmm. like to try and subvert reader expectations sometimes and, and give them something that they didn't expect, but that they like more than what they expected. Mm -hmm. um, but in that process, uh, as I was answering your question, I completely forgot what the question was. <laughs> And it's been a long day and I'm very tired. So, oh, Discovery Writer. There we go. Hey, everybody. We're going to cut that out. I For someone know. who completely forgot the question, you answered it like spot on. Like you, you got it really good. Yeah, so I, but very much a Discovery Writer. I will outline like the next scene or two, if mm -hmm. that, but it's usually just the title of what, what's going to happen in the scene. That's about it. That, that's, that's good. I don't have, my problem is that I will, uh, accidentally come up with the whole story <laughs> in my mind and the whole thing will just come to them like oh man i was planning on being an organic writer but now i can't because i know what happens and then you find yourself getting stuck yeah well you can still be organic in that way like mm -hmm. i've made outlines i've outlined an entire novel and then it didn't i didn't follow the outline it's just so, a, opposed to flowing you know following the natural flow of what the character wants rather than right. having to stick to it as a rule i guess Right. What what would my characters really do in this situation? My basic rule, my my formula is very simple. It's just to create pe characters that people love and then mess up their lives, um, <laughs> and and that's really what it is. What's going to mess up their? They're happy now. I'm glad they're happy. How can I ruin that? Um, exactly. And that's that's what that's what really drives the story. And so with the Hand of Adonai series, I definitely have an overarching idea. I I know where they're going to end up. I know what you know the ultimate battle looks like. Um, I know what shape that's going to take. I just don't know how they're going to arrive there. Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, I do now because I've I've actually written written the entire series. So I've already written the end. Um, so I know that now, but I didn't know that kind of going into it and discovering that. Um, was a lot of fun. I bet so. I bet that adds a lot more enjoyment where, you know, a lot more enjoyment, almost like you're reading it as you're writing it, I guess. Yeah. yeah um, exactly. and you mentioned character development, you know, a, a couple of times. Do you go about that organically too, or do you like to do like the character sketches and the outlines and the brainstorming, or do you just kind of like to get to know them as you go along? A little bit of both. Um, I'll do some of the uh, early on character work. Um, and I will try and find out as much as I can about the characters. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I begin writing, um, I always challenge myself to put something, some sort of scene that, that where a character does something that I don't expect. Um, mm -hmm. and so I think, what would normal people do? And then I say, okay, so a normal per person would do A, this person's going to do B. And then mm -hmm. I, I challenge myself to figure out why. And what that does. Oh, I like that. Yeah, what it does is it helps me understand that my characters are not my characters. They are, you know, their own people making their own decisions. And there's something that's happened to them in their past that I don't know. Um, the prime example from the Hand of Adonai series is Erica. Mm -hmm. And I won't spoil it, but there are certain things about Erica that are um, interesting and unique. And people notice it, um, but it's not, it's not explained right away mm -hmm. um, because I didn't know what the answer was. Um, and it took me until book two to figure it out. So mm -hmm. I won't spoil it. 
tell you that that the, the the questions I raise about Erica in book one are answered in very early in book two. That's um, good. <laughs> That's good to hear. <laughs> yeah, and I I think it really changes. It definitely changed the way I saw her as a character and her development as a character. And um, the the readers of the series all point to Erica as being their favorite. And mm -hmm. maybe that's because she's my favorite too. Uh, she's one of, she's probably the favorite character I've ever written. Um, really? That's, yeah, that's yeah. yeah, she's real, she's real neat. And so um, her story really develops in book two. They have a mind of their own and they don't always do what we want them to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> that's for exactly. sure. I wanted to talk for a second about some of the creatures in fantasy. I know most all most all the books have the dragons and the elves and the dwarves and all that. Is there any any wiggle room there for you to put your own creative spin on that type of character, or do you mainly have to adhere to the fixed rules that all fantasy novels stick to? No, I think all I think there's plenty of wiggle room because mm -hmm. if you read a variety of fantasy novels, you'll notice that they're not always elves, they're not always dwarves. Um, the elves sometimes act like elves and sometimes they don't, mm -hmm. um, but they, they, there are certain, uh, you know, I guess standards, uh, you can have elves that don't live in the woods. They can live in the city. They can live in the mountains if they want, but usually that's going to require a little bit of an explanation. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's just something that you can do as you're building your world. Uh, I tend to start with the archetypes, kind of the Tolkien archetypes, um, and twist it a little bit from there um mm -hmm. the you know i i think it's in tolkien's book where you know the the elves and the humans kind of work together mm -hmm. uh, and so i i wanted to have elves and humans that didn't really like each other but that's something that happened in if you play a lot of video games dragon age origins you see the same thing where elves are like subjugated by the humans i kind of took the reverse role where uh, mm -hmm. Elves had subjugated humans, and the humans rose up and, and took back the, the throne. And now the elves have been subjugated, and so there's that power struggle between the two. But and then that kind of, there's all that cultural stuff that goes and kind of enriches that, as, you know, as well when it comes to, I mean, politics, and it, it goes into everything. Absolutely. And so mm -hmm. there's that. You can tweak their magic a little bit. You can tweak their origins a little bit. Um, you, so there, there is some wiggle room, um, as long as you're not going too far and saying that dwarves are like nine feet tall, like some people are going to have a real problem with that. The mm -hmm. gnome, you know, the gnome towered over him at 11 feet tall. And she's like, wait, wait, wait gnomes? No, that's, that's not how it's upset some people. <laughs> yeah. There, some people will be kind of upset by that. So, mm -hmm. um, but you can, one of the things that you can do, and, and I think you get a lot of mileage out of this in not just in fantasy, but anything is taking archetypes and, and kind of mixing them together. Mm -hmm. um, just kind of mixing them until they red and blue become purple or whatever the case may be. So taking elements of one culture and another culture and mixing them together or physical characteristics of one culture and another culture and mixing those together and kind of coming up with your own. Um, that's, that's, I think where you can get a lot of wiggle room and a lot of, um, kind of more unique ideas. That's good. I noticed there's a, a, a little bit of allegory in the Hand of Adonai series, and really that's something that you see with a lot of fantasy with like Narnia and even, even Lord of the Rings to an extent. It, mm -hmm. How do you go about doing that so that it's not overpowered, so that it kind of just naturally blends in with a story that it's not overly obvious maybe? Um, I, I'm trying to think of how to answer this without being too specific to the series. Uh, I'll say something that I think it, maybe it will intrigue the readers. Um, the allegory that's that's running through the pages of the Hand of Adonai is not the allegory that you think you're seeing. Um, uh, yeah, I've got. Well, now I'm curious. <laughs> now I'm yeah. curious about that. I'm I'm hoping one thing that Brandon Sanderson does is uh, you get to the end of his, his novels and you go, wait, what? How did that happen? And yeah. You go back and you read it and you go, oh, how did I miss it? And so I'm, I'm trying my hand at that. We'll see how successful I am. But um, oh. there are allegorical elements, but it's not as allegorical as you think. And some of the elements that you're picking up on are probably not what you think they might be. Um, not everything has been revealed. And hmm. so some of it's now pretty I'm really intrigued. <laughs> now I'm really intrigued because I haven't finished the series yet. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, a lot of it's pretty easy when you look at it. Like, there's mm -hmm. like the big things are pretty easy. You go, okay, I get, I get it. You know, Adonai is the Hebrew name for God. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not going to really surprise a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can see certain allegories there, but um, there are some other more subtle ones at work uh, that may or may not come to fruition in later series. Interesting. I'm going to uh, keep that in mind. Now I'm not going to know what to trust. What am I I'm kidding? Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's some surprises. That's good. Everybody likes surprises toward the end of stuff. Right, right. So. Are pulled out of me slightly. Um, yeah. What are, what are some of the, some of the common mistakes that pe like newer writers might put in fantasy, maybe, maybe some, some cliches or, or, you know, any kind of common mistakes that you need to watch out for. I really think that's the number one issue is the cliches <laughs> is that they um, they rely too heavily on uh, worlds that too closely resemble that of uh, Tolkien or Narnia mm -hmm. or, you know, insert favorite fantasy series here. Mm -hmm. um, fantasy readers like, new and exciting things and, and different things but um it's it's a, a problem that all writers have especially when they're beginning is how to be inspired by something without copying something mm. and so my my recommendation would be to again kind of mix mix and match um, what does Tolkien look like when you mix it with narnia or in my case what does jumanji look like when you mix it with skyrim um, and, <laughs> that's a perfect description of the series <laughs> yeah it was tron meets narnia but now i've i've had to update it's it's jumanji meets skyrim so um, that is awesome i love but, that that needs yeah. to be like a little blurb like somebody needs to put that in the review somewhere i think so we'll have to i'll have to put that up somewhere but um we'll talk to molly we'll make molly do it yeah that's that's a good thing <laughs> that's a good rule though. um but when you when you think of it in that regard um a lot more options come out. And that's, I think, the easiest way to kind of avoid that pitfall of, of stumbling into those cliches is to mm -hmm. try and find, uh, to deliberately subvert some of those, mix some of those, combine them, um, separate them, uh, whatever you need to do. But it, they're, they're great starting points. I mean, uh, Lord of the Rings is Lord of the Rings. Like, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a classic. Exactly. Um, but if all you're doing is writing Lord of the Rings part two, that's going to be problematic. So you got to find new and inventive ways to kind of change things up a little bit. I like that. And I like that you mentioned bringing some of a, sort of a mix of the different genres, because if, that, if, if I understand it right, the fantasy and sci-fi and all that sort of falls under a, a, a larger genre of like speculative. Is that the word for speculative, it? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So speculative would cover fantasy, science fiction, paranormal, um, theoretically horror anything supernatural mm -hmm. um and i'm so guessing you can that kind of gives you a little bit more freedom to maybe blend elements of the different ones together to get some more originality to it yeah and and you can I, people do it all the time it's it's hard to write a, a mystery that's not also a thriller it's hard to write a suspense mm -hmm. that's not that's also not a thriller uh and so you can blend elements of mystery and suspense and <laughs> thrillers and horror you can do all of that. Um, then you get to that point where someone's like, oh, what, what genre do you write in? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'll let you know when I figure it out. <laughs> yeah. You do want to know what, I mean, if, if you look at um, The Hand of Adonai, it's, it's, very, mm -hmm. it's a fantasy novel. It is very much a fantasy novel, even though it's got a contemporary American storyline running through it as well. Mm -hmm. And so there is some sci-fi to it, um, but it's, it's firmly rooted in the fantasy traditions uh, of it's it's as if you're reading Narnia, but you could find out what was going on in the real world at the same time yeah. when we're gone. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of how I approached it. So there's, you know, it, it is a little, you know, I guess mystery, but it's also a little bit, it's predominantly fantasy. If the question that you want to ask, and, and the reason you ask this is because publishers ask it, and it's because retailers ask it. It's mm -hmm. not the publishers who have the final say, it's really the bookstores. Um, and mm -hmm. so Barnes and Noble wants to know where to put your book. And if you can't mm -hmm. tell them, then they're not going to put your book on any shelf or they're going to put it in the wrong shelf. Um, readers of Hand of Adonai are fantasy readers. They like it. Um, mm -hmm. Even though there are other elements that they don't normally see in fantasy, that would still go on the fantasy shelf. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You need to know where to put it. I like that. Yeah. I like that yeah. a lot. And I like that about the book. That's something to keep in mind too, is you know, keep in mind where, what book do you want yours to be sitting next to? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's a really good way to think of it. Yeah. You know, what book would you put this next to on the shelf? I like Aside that. from some author who has the same last name as you. Like, 
<laughs> yeah, maybe a little bit too on the nose there. Yeah. <laughs> More like what what story would it be, <laughs> be sitting exactly. next to? Exactly. Well, I have really enjoyed having you on the show. We've only got a couple minutes left, and I, I wanted to ask you before we left, if, if you had to pick one piece of advice to give to an aspiring, maybe not even a fantasy writer, but just an aspiring writer of any kind, what would that be? What would be the, the really the one thing you'd want them to know? I think the thing, it, it's hard to, to narrow it down to one, so I'll, I'll make it a compound <laughs> recommendation, and it's the thing that really got me going. Um, I was at the Blue Ridge uh, writers conference as a writer originally mm -hmm. years and years and years ago um, and I think it was Todd McNair who was talking and he said something about something to the effect of you have to start thinking of yourself as a writer well I always thought of myself as someone who wrote I didn't think of myself as mm -hmm. a writer he says if you sit down on a plane and the person next to you says what do you do and you tell them what you do for your day job maybe that's not the right train of thought so I was telling everyone I was a teacher left and right. And and so now when people ask what I do, I say I'm a writer because that's what I am. I also teach high school, uh, but I I define myself as a writer. That's that's how I look at myself. And in so doing, when you do that, you take on a persona and um, a way of looking at yourself that gives you a little more self-confidence, and but also a little more motivation mm -hmm. uh, because you are not a writer if you are not writing and so in order to think of yourself as a writer you must write and so the biggest thing to do is to think of yourself as a writer and then to write and to do it um i would also say see this is like my third thing um you've got to, <laughs> keep going this is good yeah. <laughs> keep, keep, keep going you've got, to, you've got, to read got like five memes playing out of my head so you yes. <laughs> memes are the best um you've got to you've got to read and you have to consume as much information as humanly possible about how to, to become better at the craft. Um, you, you just have to, to learn, whether that's formally through a college or career or, or college uh, you know, stuff, or mm -hmm. if it's just uh, buying books uh, on the subject or uh, listening to podcasts like genre chat. Mm -hmm. Or for or your podcast. <laughs> yeah. You can um, advertise that a little bit too. That's a good exactly. one. Um, it, writing excuses, uh, those types of things, they exist and they're free and you can YouTube it and there's no reason not to. Um, and so that's what I would say is study the craft, become good at what you do, make sure you're writing and then think of yourself as a writer. Maybe not in that order, reverse those orders, but yeah. <laughs> I, like, I like that. Uh, I think that'd be good in any order. And for anyone that's watching this and doesn't know, Aaron hosts an awesome podcast with his dad, Alton Gansky and Molly Jareli called First in Fiction, which is really good <laughs> and uh, has helped me a lot in my writing journey as well. So I definitely suggest y'all check that out too. But I have really enjoyed having you on the show. I've learned a lot about the genre and I've enjoyed getting to know a, a little bit more about what you're doing and I can't wait to read the next book. But um, thank you so much and I hope we can have you back on uh, sometime in the future. Absolutely, anytime. Yeah, and what's your website if anybody wants to go and, and learn a bit, little bit more about your books or, or the different things you do? Yeah, it's just AaronGansky.com. So awesome. A-A-R-O-N-G-A-N-S-K-Y dot com and you'll find awesome. anything and everything that you need there. Awesome. Thank you so much for having us and we will see you guys next time. All right.